Hi, Travis. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Good. Thank you. Just testing a mic. She's not say, she's not speaking to me. It helps when I unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> totally helps. Hey everyone, I, I think Gerald sent a note, but is it possible for you to email us or me, even a, a, us all a PDF of the presentation today? Yeah, Travis, um, do you mind sending that out? I think you've got the latest version. Sure, I'm going to have to upload it and then I'll send you a link.
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Livability Strategy Session 3. I'm Jeff Williams, Director of City Planning and Development. We get started in just one moment, let a few people make their way in. Um, we're trying to make sure we also get uh, all of um, our panelists in the appropriate places, so that way we're ready to go to uh, spend a very productive uh, 90 minutes together. So hang in there with us for a few moments and uh, we'll get started at around 3.35. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. Again, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for the Livability Strategy Session 3. That's part of the updating of the city's comprehensive plan and the creation of the KC Sewer Playbook. As I mentioned before, I'm Jeff Williams, Director of City Planning Development. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, over the course of the next 90 minutes, you're going to hear from um, department staff, as well as the consultant team that is working on putting together the recommendations related to our updated comprehensive plan. But more importantly, this is a time that uh, we want to be able to hear from uh, all of you that are participating today and be able to share some feedback from what we talked about in, in previous sessions. So thank you for, for joining us. A little bit of housekeeping, we can move to the next slide, just as a reminder to everyone, um, that for the Zoom webinar guides, um, you can see the, the ways in which we'll take feedback in a variety of ways. Click on the icons to um, post comments um, through the chat or use the raise hand feature to ask a question. Um, and again, you we'll, when that comes that time, we'll wrap ourselves up. We're scheduled to go for about 90 minutes um, and we're really looking forward again to participation and comments from a variety of different fronts. Let's take a look at the next slide. I'll just tell you again, um, we will be using some uh, Mentimeter polling with this as well today. Um, 
if you're able to use the Mentimeter poll and you'll get directions for that, you'll need actually yeah. a computer or your smartphone, type in a code and give us response back. Um, if you're able to, unable to vote, uh, yeah. use the chat feature or the raised hand feature and we'll make sure that we capture your responses. Uh, again, uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions or get want to put any questions into the, the meeting chat and we will stop um, yeah. along the way to um, certainly answer questions that have been asked. And then what we're going to be talking about today, again, this is a, a third um, meeting relates to this particular strategy topic of the comprehensive plan update. But today, um, we're doing overviews of defining livability and uh, what it means to be Kansas Cityans. Um, we'll be talking about some of the drafting of the KC Spirit Playbook goals um, and their connection to, to livability. And just provide some examples of some of the recommendations for improved livabilities and with goals and, and strategy discussions. And then we'll also tell you what the, the next steps are. Um, with that, again, thank you all for being here. Glad to have you here. I'm going to roll over. Here is the Mentimeter code. I'll do this piece. And then um, I know that others will pick up, but um, it's menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com. Um, and if you go there, you will enter in the code that you see on screen, and we'll repeat a little later, but the code is 58619974. You can also use the QR code if you need a moment to do that with your smartphone, and you could use capture the QR code on screen, and it'll take you directly into uh, Mentimeter. With that, I think it takes us through the logistics and housekeeping for today. Thank you, Jeff. My computer is not responding fast enough, but now this is the chance for everyone to use your Mentimeter for the first time if you've not already. The code, whenever there's an opportunity for you all to comment, the code and the link that you can use with your smartphone is always going to be at the top of the screen. It says menti.com and then there's the code, it's the same one that was on the previous slide. My colleague Maddie is in the meeting today, and so she'll also put a link to that in the chat. You can click the link. If you do that, it's likely to open up another window. In that window, you'll be able to respond to our Minty questions and comment and basically see the slides. If you are unable to do that, it's totally fine. Just go ahead and use the chat if you have that option available to you on the device that you're using. And then you can answer the questions that way. Maddie will grab them and pop them into the Mentimeter so that they show on screen. I don't know that there's anybody on the phone today. I think everyone is using a device, I think, to participate. So you should have access to the chat so you can participate. So our first question is, where do you live or work? You can select all that apply. A lot of you are in the center of the city, some in the Northland, fewer in the South. We're looking at this in terms of the river going North between the river and 63rd Street as the center of the city and 63rd Street South as our Southern part. And it seems to me that 15 or so of you all have participated, which is about half. And I know that there are about a half dozen of us from staff on here. So it seems like a few more people might need to participate. But for time, I'm going to go to the next one. Again, you can always respond in the chat if you need to. And we'll grab that slow device, you all bear with me, please. Okay, here's our second question. We really like to know if you've attended a strategy session for the playbook previously. This is the livability strategy session. Livability is going on, serviceability is going on, or serviceability strategy session is next week. We've had several mobility strategy sessions and we've had visibility strategy sessions. Okay, it looks like we've got 16 respondents. Most of you have attended and welcome to those that are new. And if you're wondering how I can tell how many have participated, I'm looking in the bottom right hand corner. So as we go through, I'll have an idea of how many are participating as we go through and so will you. Let me ask you all another question then. We'd love to know which of the strategy sessions you have been participating in. As I mentioned before, there's visibility, mobility, livability, and serviceability. Select all that apply. I know some of you, we have seen in all of the strategy sessions and, and the way that that graph jumped up is an indication of that. 
And so we're glad that you are taking some time with us today and we really appreciate that. So far, serviceability and visibility are in the lead in terms of people who have participated in those sessions. More serviceability followed by visibility and mobility and livability. So those last three are kind of neck and neck in terms of participation. Give you a few more seconds to respond to the question. I see 11 of you all have responded so far. And again, if you are just now joining, the way that we're participating today or what you see on screen, the way people are participating in that is they are using the address at the top of the screen and then entering the code. It says minty.com. And then once you get there, if you're using your smartphone to do that or a larger device, then put in the code, which is that 58619974 that appears at the top of the screen. Also, my colleague Maddie will put the link, the URL to Mintimeter into the chat. And so if you join link, you can just click that and you'll be able to participate. All right, looks like we have a lot of people that are what I would call kind of seasoned in the playbook strategy sessions. The next thing we wanna to talk to you all about is the Spirit Playbook and its relationship to focus. And I think Bo is going to walk you through this. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And sorry, I don't have a video. Can everyone hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, good. So. So yeah, so the, most of you have been to these before, so I won't I won't uh, spend too much time on this. But this KC Spirit Playbook is is going to be the city's new comprehensive plan when it's completed later uh, this year. So uh, a comprehensive plan deals with the built environment, the physical development of our city, and it guides decisions and investments related to that. You know, uh, over like a twenty year time horizon. Uh, so our, our current comprehensive plan is the Focus Kansas City plan. It was adopted in 1997. Uh, so it's, it's about 25 years old now, and it's, it's, it is uh, perhaps overdue for, a, for an update and, a, and a adoption of a revised and, and updated comprehensive plan. Next slide. This is a quick... Uh, uh, organizational structure of the plan that we're about to begin drafting. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we began this whole process by talking about what our overall vision and values are and, and established a series of 10 goal statements. And so we're kind of working from the very broad uh, aspirational and visionary uh, ideas down to the more specific goals like we're gonna talk about today, the more specific strategies. So, um, when the plan is done, we'll have 10 goals that, that, that are supported by, I think we have uh, 28 or nine objectives. And those are things like neighborhood livability and uh, mobility and uh, 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 environmental health and resiliency and things like that. Parks and open spaces will be, will be all those objectives that are kind of the foundation of the plan. That's where all of our strategies, including the ones we're talking to you tonight about, uh, will reside. Well, those all these strategies will be within those objectives, and we are going to begin writing those. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But we're going to begin writing those uh, this 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 month, as soon as these two final two strategy sessions are over for livability and serviceability. And uh, I will begin to to put get, to get into full plan production mode. Next slide. Um, so this is our vision statement. Uh, I won't read it, but, uh, but but again, this was developed through through the last two years of community input. Um, it, it was based also a lot on the previous focus vision statement as well. Uh, but we vetted this through interactions with the public, uh, based a, a lot on what we heard from the public through our first year of engagement uh, and through our empowerment committee as well. And this kind of guides, this, this talks about what, when we do all the things in the plan, what our city will look like, uh, you know, if we're, if we're successful in implementing and, and, re, and realizing all of these different ideas, what will our city look like when that's done? Next slide. Uh, these are our 10 goals. That, that they, these are the abbreviated versions of them. There really is a lot more detail under each of these headings. Um, but again, each of, each of the, uh, the plan, these, these 10 goals kind of guide the entire structure of the plan. 
They set the direction for the plan uh, and all the recommendations we talk about will kind of relate back to these 10 goals. Next slide. I think this is where I end it back. It is. So the last time that we all talked to you all, we were talking about livability. And just for those who are new, when we're talking about livability, we're talking about it in terms of the four items that you see there. We're talking about it in terms of community assets and connections. When you think about assets, you think about people's homes, you think about community centers, you think about having services and grocery and all those types of amenities. But we also think about how those assets are connected. And we think about it in terms of how they're connected physically, socially, and culturally. We also think about all the city services that you need to make your neighborhood thrive and the infrastructure that supports that. Housing is really important as well as eliminating disparities. That's the framework for livability that we're working on. And we talked about that at our first strategy session, but then we also asked what did livability mean to you all? And for everyone who participated, this is just a summary of what we heard during that conversation. You all said that livability means that you have safe, walkable, clean, and diverse neighborhoods that have a lot of amenities nearby them, and that creates a sense of place. You talked about people and the connections between them being really, really important. You talked about accessibility in all of its forms, about healthy natural environments, and the preservation of neighborhood character. That was our framework for what we're talking about in terms of livability and wanting to be sure that we all understand where everyone's coming from and what your perspective is. But as we got into that, you also said that livability involves intentionally engaging residents and mapping what those assets are in each neighborhood and making sure that um, there's equitable access to those. You talked about multimodal transportation improvements being important so that our assets are accessible and our neighborhoods are accessible places. And you can also not just access the places in the neighborhood or the homes there, but also community events that are happening there. You talked about providing enhanced city services and infrastructure to neighborhoods in the future as being part of livability, as well as listening to all the communities and then prioritizing areas that have the greatest need addressing financial gaps and challenges, particularly connected to um, equity and racism that impacts some of our distressed neighborhoods as being something that was important to be thinking about as well. Incentivizing rehabilitation activities and smaller scale development was also something that you said is important for neighborhood livability or connected to neighborhood livability. And then combining infrastructure projects with affordable housing and more. Also in our first strategy session, we asked for your vision for neighborhood livability. Once we understood what you were thinking about when we say that, those words together, what do you think is the greatest need? What are community assets? What's, what does it mean to be connected? What type of enhanced city services and infrastructure is most important? How do we make sure development's affordable, diverse, and equitable? How do we eliminate those disparities? And then what additional questions, comments, or ideas should we be considering? In the second session, we talked about how to make that vision for livability a reality. And we talked about it in terms of strong and desirable neighborhoods, having a connected city. And again, that connected city is not just physically, it's also socially and culturally. We talked about community assets. Sometimes people use the word amenities when they're talking about community assets. There's your infrastructure and city services again. And then we narrow down to housing affordability, quality and diversity, and again, eliminating disparities. One of the key things that we talked about at our last session, and that was just a couple of months ago in February, we asked for each of those categories of how to make the vision for livability important, or excuse me, how to make that a reality. We asked for the three most important things in relationship to each topic. So when we said strong and desirable neighborhoods, you can see the results that we got here. One of the key things is more amenities and social offerings, land use policies and amendments were some of the key things to do in relationship to that. When we asked about connectivity at the neighborhood level, these are some of the strategies or concepts that we discussed during our strategy session number two. Investments in all modes of transportation got a lot of votes and there's a lot of um, interest in that one. And then um, making sure that we don't have people displaced as we're making improvements. 
Here's our third category, which is creating numerous community assets. What three things are important here? The one with the most votes is on the right-hand side of my screen, and which is introducing asset-based maps um, and resident desires. So focusing on what people need and being sure that we map that in terms of an asset. Number three, or not number three, but the we asked for which three prioritization techniques would work best if we were talking about infrastructure and city services. We know that money is spent on infrastructure and services in, in our city as well as many others. And so what's a way to tackle that in terms of prioritization? And what you can see on screen are the, I, the top three. You've got enhanced um, resident engagement around this topic, balancing asset mate excuse me, asset maintenance versus new investment, followed by data-driven prioritization of city maintenance and activities is what you all selected at that meeting. When we asked about three approaches to housing that are most important, the top thing in terms of uh, something to do and think about had to do with incentivizing more housing rehab than new construction. We talked about eliminating disparities. We had several options that we discussed. We asked what was most important. A lot of the voting was probably fairly equally distributed. And so you've got some of these in the middle here, neighborhood access and education on city resources and services processes was important. Diverse leadership at all levels of decision-making were some of the things that were most important to you all in terms of approaches to eliminating those disparities. What we want to do now is build on the conversation that we've had from our February conversation and the one before that in terms of the mobility. And so Bill's going to take it away. Thanks, Travis. Uh, my name is Bill Michael, and uh, I work for WSP. And I am excited to be here and, and feel privileged to have the opportunity to engage in this work with all of you. Uh, so Travis, uh, thank you and, and Bo for going through what uh, we have done up to this point. And as far as what we will present today, there are six categories uh, that in the first two sessions were formulated within uh, livability, and then uh, also draw your attention to what we need from you. Uh, so there will be opportunities as we go through here. Uh, but in the back of your mind, just, uh, you know, think about what's missing, what needs clarity, uh, you know, does something need to be stressed a bit more than it is? Uh, what are equity concerns and uh, additional suggestions? Next slide, please. One sec, I wanna add something to what you just said, sure. Bill, which is that you all, what we're going to be focusing on today is directly tied to the conversations that we've been having. This is by no means every single potential recommendation for livability that you'll see in the comprehensive plan. But this is a section of them. And a lot of it, again, is based on the conversations that we've been having with you all over the last few months. Yeah, thanks, Travis. Um, and we will talk about this again at, at the end of the presentation, but I think it's worth mentioning uh, a number of different times. Um, users of the plan will be able to sort or filter action items and recommendations in the, in the final document. So. Um, you know, each action item will be merged into the appropriate objective in the plan document, and it will be searchable online. Um, and, and again, uh, you'll hear this several times also, but uh, this isn't the end of the process. Um, after this, staff will continue to refine these recommendations uh, based on best practices and, and other city plans, and uh, there will be opportunities for, for further input. Uh, so with that said, uh, we can move on to strong and desirable neighborhoods. Um, and so the way the each category is set up, um, you will see the what we've heard slide. And a lot of these are direct quotes uh, um, from participants in sessions one and two. If you recall, uh, if, or if you participated in, in session two in particular, you may recall voting on priority topic areas within each of these six categories. And uh, these are comments within the top two or three um, topic areas with, within each category. So um, I also will mention that uh, I am gonna move fairly quickly. There is a lot of content, um, but of course this is all things that we can revisit. Um, 
I also want to say that these are not all of the comments that we heard, but are representative of some of the themes that came out of sessions one and two. Uh, so what did we hear? Uh, strong and desirable neighborhoods uh, centered around land use policies and amendments. We heard a lot about the area plans and the work that has gone into those area plans and, and uh, respecting that work and referring back to it. Um, heard a lot about uh, housing and, and accessory dwelling units and, and how do we facilitate uh, you know, more construction of those. Um, listening to, to neighborhood residents and their needs and desires um, and prioritize livability policies for implementation. Uh, more amenities and social offerings. Uh, so a, a lot about uh, the unique character of individual neighborhoods and also providing more opportunities for social interactions. Uh, and then changing our approach to safety. So this would involve infrastructure investments uh, to make walking, biking uh, safer. Uh, more neighborhoods uh, that uh, you know need sidewalks, curb and gutters, that sort of thing. And then uh, um, potentially some improvements to the transit stops. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, I, I want to draw your attention to the fact that there is a direct correlation between your comments or participants' uh, comments from sessions one and two, and then the draft recommendations here. And again, um, as Travis mentioned, these are certainly not all of the draft recommendations, but uh, we simply don't have time to go through them all here. Um, but these are um, some of them. And on the right-hand side in this gray box, you will see, um, the vision statements and the playbook goals that are associated with each of these. So uh, jumping in, reviewing land use policies and identifying necessary amendments. Um, and those may include amendments to uh, land use designations, zoning, subdivision standards, design standards, those sorts of things. Um, there was discussion about exploring uh, parking minimums, uh, facilitating accessory, more accessory, accessory dwelling units, um, design standards to encourage all modes of transportation, uh, enhancing amenities and social interactions within neighborhoods. Uh, so there is an asset mapping or, or inventory of amenities within each neighborhoods that can occur and opportunities for social interactions and sub area plans and identifying gaps and, and creating strategies to fill those. Um, and then creating or enhancing existing public spaces that encourage those social interactions. Um, also interactions with schools and, and local organizations. Next slide, please. Also, as you are changing slides for you, Bill, but also you are at the bottom of each of the slides where you have some draft action steps that support what you're seeing on screen. We wanna know if we're in the right space or we're on the right track. So give us a thumbs up, thumbs down, question mark if you're unsure with your minting year. So let us know how we're doing, if we've captured things correctly. And I can already see there's some comment in the chat. So you're gonna have an opportunity as we go through to also add some things too. So changing our approach to providing safety. Um, there are areas where uh, residents have identified gaps in sidewalks, uh, a need for in, uh, increased amenities at street crossings to make those a bit safer, safer uh, lighting. Uh, in certain areas. Uh, we mentioned improvements to transit stops earlier. Some of the specifics we heard uh, were about warming lamps and blue lights and that sort of thing. Uh, investments to encourage alternate forms of transportation, uh, specifically, you know, walkability, bikeability, and uh, uh, fairly specific strategy that came out of this uh, crime prevention through environmental design, incorporating that into the design process for public and private improvements. Next slide, please. So here's your chance. I know there are some things that maybe we, there's some things that we probably missed. There could be some things that need clarity. There could be some things that bring up equity concerns or other ideas. This is your time right now to please use your Minty meter and tell us what's missing. Also, if it's easier for you to just say it, go ahead and raise your hand so we can have you unmute and share your thoughts with the group.
And I can see in the chat, Marcus has said he um, thought we talked about community-based policing. And I know that's in the notes, in the larger version of the notes, I've seen that. Um, the last police administration and the interim, in my judgment, and in conversation with police seem not to place a value on community policing. So that's something for neighborhood livability. Um, Greg is saying some areas like downtown may be overparked. The plaza needs parking minimums, doesn't need to be overparked. Um, Lisa in the chat is saying current city policies favor large scale development projects that are often seen as intrusive by older neighborhoods. Shifting priorities to give equal footing to smaller projects is good for neighborhoods, job creation, and increases the range of affordable housing options. So that's from the chat, and we'll be sure and grab all of those and put them into the notes. And Trevise, um, yes, Chrissy uh, Juarez has a hand raised. Hi guys, um, I think we've had this discussion a little bit before, but for me as a lifelong Kansas City resident, one of the main concerns that I have right now, of course, is um, the safety in the city. And there's a couple different issues, but I think that the policing is one of the main issues. And I've had quite, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, but I think our number one issue with crime in city is in this city is normally domestically related. And some of the issues that I think that need to be addressed is the way that the police department follows up and investigates crimes in Kansas City. Um, just in my experience, you know, if the police visit um, a domestic disturbance and there are children in the home and there's been a violent disturbance, none of the police department really hotline a situation or note the children that are present. There's no contact with their schools. These are bystanders that are being exposed to violent crimes that don't have any resources like social workers or therapy or anybody to kind of work out the, the situations that they've witnessed or been um, a part of. And then as these crimes are not properly um, investigated and there's not charges, then we see people that want to retaliate um, against people because they don't have justice for their family members. And I think that as we continue to see that instead of changing the policing, we continue to fund and continue to fund the, the two cities with the highest crime rate in the state of Missouri are the two cities that have um, the, the income tax on um, per city, the city earnings tax. And I think that that for livability, there's been so many different ways that the police could have been, if they're unfamiliar with their neighborhoods, I know we struggle with trash services. So if they want to do that extra time of overtime, put them on the back of a trash truck, let them get to know the neighborhoods, let them get to see what's going on. I think there's a different way of making, if we want to talk about servicing our neighborhood with our police, what happens to the police being a part of our community and a part of support system as opposed to a part of the policing where it, it's just not done it, it's just not coming from a spirit of being a part of the community as a part as maybe monitoring the community uh, i don't know exactly how that would look but in my personal experience i had a sister that was uh, murdered in a domestic violent crime um, I understand what it, the personal feelings of wanting justice for a family member when the police department doesn't properly investigate. There's a lot of frustration and people that don't have very strong ties to the community continue to want to take these measures into their own hands, which just continues our violence. And I think we have to get to a point where we can acknowledge that in Kansas City, our policing is an issue. And it's probably the, one of the top issues in our city. Um, and the city services, which the policing is part of, really, really needs to take a closer look at reality. I know that some conversations may be hard to have, but these are conversations that we have to have in order to move forward. Safety should be our number one priority. We should be able to enjoy our city and enjoy each other. And with the messes that we have with crime and um, litter, I think those, those issues go hand in hand with uh, our city services, including most importantly, our police department. Thank you, Chrissy. And just for time, you all, we're gonna go to the next topic. 
If you are still giving um, your comments on this slide, you can keep on doing that in the Mentimeter. You can put it in the chat. When I go to the next slide, you'll see a blue button and it will show and you'll be able to touch that. It's for Connected City, physically, culturally, and socially. Go ahead, Bill. Thanks, Travis. And again, uh, I'll mention we're starting here with uh, comments from sessions one and two, and then we'll move on to some draft recommendations. And uh, again, those are not all of the draft recommendations, and uh, there, there are more. Uh, we just don't have time to go through all of them. So uh, and, uh, what we heard related to connected city, uh, investments in all modes of transportation. We heard a lot about non-car options, um, bus rapid transit, investments in transportation, such as bike paths, pedestrians, um, and then uh, displacement proofing policy agenda, ensuring that neighborhoods are not being destabilized by city policies and practices. Neighborhood associations uh, was a uh, an important topic as well. Um, we uh, heard uh, a lot about how to support neighborhood associations and neighborhoods in general. Next slide, please. So again, connected city. These connections are physical, social, and cultural. And uh, some examples. Uh, of recommendations, making investments and choices for all types of transportation options, um, developing a master transportation plan for the city to provide a set of guiding principles that will uh, be incorporated into infrastructure investments moving forward, uh, specifically the design of those taking into account all modes of transportation, identify and enhance inter-area multimodal transportation routes. And specifically what we mean by that is, um, you know, I want to get around in my neighborhood on a, on a bicycle, where's the best route to do that? And then at a different scale, not only do I wanna get around in my neighborhood, but I wanna go from my neighborhood to uh, the commercial center that's nearby or a neighborhood that's nearby. What's the best route to do that uh, on a bicycle or if I'm walking? Um, and identifying those and ensuring that there's uh, facilities that are on street or next to the street to facilitate that transportation mode. Um, adopting a displacement proofing policy agenda for neighborhoods. Um, I, I saw in the chat uh, something scroll by related to um, you know smaller developers. These strategies are um, targeted at uh, facilitating that. Uh, one possibility is acquiring property, the city ac acquiring property in strategic locations, and then um, disposing of that property or, or you know, um, asking for development uh, proposals through a competitive process to meet specific goals. Those goals may be affordable housing, uh, incremental development, uh, transit-oriented development, um, context sensitive design, those types of things. Um, but the whole idea is to level the playing field a bit um, and try and uh, give the uh, residents uh, in the neighborhood uh, more of an opportunity. Um, and then review land use policies to permit or relax regulation on those types of development, incremental infill um, and tiny houses, accessory dwelling units um, and other entry level investments trying to, uh, again, facilitate that and level the playing field a bit. Next slide, please. Supporting and empowering existing or new neighborhood associations. Um, so exploring an enhancements to the neighborhood service delivery program, uh, assist neighborhoods in completing the self-assessment process I mentioned earlier, and then tailoring services to those neighborhood, neighborhoods accordingly. Uh, you know, again, we heard a lot of that, uh, hey, neighborhoods aren't the same, and uh, they have different needs, and then develop and provide information uh, to enable uh, neighborhood residents to actively engage in improving livability uh, in their, their neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Another opportunity based on what you've heard. There's some things that are missing. I think there's some comments that are in the chat that Maddie can pop into the Mentimeter. If there are some things that need clarity, I know Vicki just said, how is the city going to acquire property? Is something to be answered and some more meat, um, some more definition applied. 
Um, what are the equity concerns? Any additional comments? Again, if you have an idea that you wanna share aloud, please go ahead and do that. You would need to raise your hand. And I see in the chat, we have from Marcus, develop and provide information It's good, but we need to give people a toolkit to use. Some questions about what the city's doing with the land bank. There's some concerns about the small landlord class and how they may be disappearing along with their investment and options for maintenance in the chat. Car speeds are excessive, related transportation connectivity in the chat. And Steve McDowell has his hand raised. All right, Steve, you should be able to unmute and go ahead. Thank you. So the, I guess one thought that about connecting the city and about making it easier for people to develop is for a, for the city to really take an aggressive role at taking care of the public realm, uh, kind of uniformly across uh, all parts of the city, especially in the areas that need to be uh, helped the most. And you know, I I think really you know we're hearing about it from safer sidewalks and so forth, but really a a, a policy decision that the city's going to own the design and the quality of the built environment uh, that they're responsible for. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying this in the right section, but at any rate, I think if, if there's a beautiful street, beautiful sidewalk, it makes it easier for a small developer or a large developer or whatever to implement these goals. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. There's another um, a couple other people their hands up. Oh, I think that was Steve. That might have just been Steve. I think that's everybody. Okay. Again, because we have so much that we are trying to share with you all today based on all of the great conversations that we've had before. I'm going to go to the third topic. You all can still add comments here if you want to. You can also put them in the chat. Our third area to talk about is community assets. It's Therese, uh, so, so what did we hear uh, in the first two sessions? Uh, introducing assets based on gaps and residents' desires. Uh, the, the first comment uh, it really kind of sums it up. Residents know their neighborhoods best and uh, engage them in determining what assets are needed. Uh, area plans was, was heard and then uh, a lifetime of engagement, sort of that plan for uh, people ages eight to 80. Um, context specific and neighborhood informed, uh, recognize assets are context based, um, more community input, and then allowing uh, neighborhood input on development, uh, balancing more assets while minimizing displacement, uh, assets to support neighborhoods and be an interest to others and uh, taking a look at best practices. Next slide, please. So associated uh, draft recommendations or action steps associated with those, defining assets and then mapping, identifying gaps, uh, and then some marketing to support them. So uh, again, looking at that asset mapping opportunity and then considering maintenance and enhancement of existing assets as opposed to always going uh, to new. Developing context sensitive and neighborhood informed amenities. Uh, so, recreational activities, public art, open spaces to neighborhoods based on identified gaps from the uh, assessments, and then the desires of residents. Balancing the introduction of more community assets while minimizing displacement. Um, considering, you know, potential displacement impacts of transformative projects uh, during the um, you know, the, the vetting process. Next slide, please. That one was a quick one. So again, if you would like to share your thoughts, please do. We're looking for the same things. And Vicki has her hand raised. And I would like you to go ahead and unmute Vicki if you can.
I saw her hand raised, but I think that she's lower than it. Um, she doesn't look muted. I can't hear it. Maybe we can, Vicki, maybe we can come back to you. Um, Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay, sorry, wasn't doing anything. Um, this relates to the last category as well as this one, but mm -hmm. um, I think it all relates seriously to equity and what that actually means. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody's got great ideas for what they, their neighborhood would be like. A lot of neighborhoods don't have any resources to be able to accomplish any of those and the city doesn't have enough money to do all of them. Um, we have really, we have a lot of neighborhoods that are very well off and can certainly pay for their own amenities and they do. Um, and then there are others that really need certain things invested to make it more livable, but they don't have any resources. So prioritizing what the city would fund and what partners to neighborhoods could fund um, similar to what was done in the neighborhood assessments where they identify their own partners and what they'd be willing to do themselves, I think is really important to bring the equity up even, um, or at least have an even playing field to try for. And then I think um, the issue of uh, transportation spending and even planning, um, I've had a number of meetings, um, mostly on the east side of town in the last six months or so that uh, there's some resentment about what the city is paying for bike lanes. <laughs> one person in a meeting told me if they had to walk by one more bike lane on a sidewalk that was falling apart in their neighborhood, they were going to kill somebody. Um, a slight exaggeration, but I think there's, I think we need to we need to really be more cognizant of targeting resources and for what purposes. Um, and there are some serious needs in all parts of the city that were promised sidewalks and curbs and gutters. They never got them. Their kids are walking to school in the culvert. Um, and we really either need to address that in here somehow or figure out a way to ma make some priorities or have some neighborhoods pay for their own stuff. Thank you, Vicki. Mm -hmm. Everyone, as we're going through section by section and you're providing your thoughts and comments, um, uh, let's presentation team to um, the request received as, as meeting organizers kind of to toggle back to review what specific area we're asking for your thoughts and comments. So again, looking over to the left side of the screen, you know, we, we have the title there, community assets, um, but if you need a bit of a, of a refresher in terms of what we're looking for your thoughts on, um, you can just drop a note in the chat and, and let us know. Thanks, Jeff. We are on community assets. And as you keep hearing us say, we're really cognizant of time and how much content we have to share with you. There's a slight chance that we won't get through all of it today. And so if y'all can bear with us until the end of the meeting, I'm going to give y'all a link in the chat at the end of this meeting that will be to these slides and you'll be able to comment and you should be able to navigate backwards and forward in that. But I need to wait until we get through this to go and do that for you all. So if you miss something, you'll have an opportunity to come back to it. Now we're to infrastructure and city services. Which relates to uh, one of the previous uh, comments we, we just had. Um, so what did we hear? Uh, enhance resident engagement. Um, uh, empower us so we may empower more. Um, when structuring follow-up to these meetings, uh, make suggestions and make sure the suggestions are implemented um, and then building resident trust by following through on these topics. Balanced asset maintenance versus new investment. Um, if we can't maintain it, don't build it. Uh, include neighborhood residents and decisions. Uh, next slide, please.
So draft recommendations, uh, enhancing resident engagement. So related to identifying and prioritizing needs and desires within neighborhoods. Uh, so things like citizen satisfaction surveys, uh, you know, are already happening, but enhance existing resident engagement tools uh, related to neighborhood level investment uh, and adopt. Uh, we had had some conversations about equi equity, uh, adopt a policy of seeking input from low income and historically underserved populations first. Uh, balance asset maintenance versus new investment. Um, so you can complete uh, fiscal or life cycle cost analysis. And there are other similar strategies related to um, prioritizing maintenance um, and then thinking about maintenance as new infrastructure investments are considered and then prioritizing maintenance of existing infrastructure over new investments. Next slide, please. And here we are again, infrastructure and city services. Is there anything in what you heard there that we could be missing? There's equity concerns, clarification, anything else? And I see Chrissy has her hand up. Can you unmute Chrissy? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so when it comes to city services, I live at 81st and North Oak. That is at the North, like North Oak and Berry Road area. My older neighborhood that was built in the 70s is called like Oak something because it has giant oak trees. Well, along the sidewalks, which were just recently replaced, are these giant trees, which I have been threatened a number of, I've owned this home for probably 20 years now, that if I cut down the tree, I could, um, get a fine from the city and these trees drop these little balls, these little spiky balls and you roll your ankle on them. They become overgrown. The city does not have time to maintain these trees. And honestly, they block the, the street lamps. I think that we need to look into giving um, a, authority to homeowners to make decisions about these things that are affecting our driveways, the sidewalks that have to be replaced. Um, our safety by having the street site not done, I would willingly take down that tree. I've done thousands of dollars with a tree work in my backyard, but these trees right up along the street, we're threatened that we will see fines if we mess with these trees, but the city has never trimmed back these trees in almost 20 years. Thank you, Chrissy. So you're looking for a more proactive response from the city, do you want? I think that they should give us the authority to maintain these things in our neighborhood. If it makes sense to take down the tree, we should get to take down the tree. I'm not asking you to pay to take down the tree. I'll mm -hmm. pay the $3,000. Just let me get rid of the dang tree. Okay. Thank you. I see in the chat from Beth, there's community assistance location for getting basics for low income. She's talking about at the Air Force excuse me, at the Air Force Base where she lives, we were they were able to rent basic things like things that you need for your baby, high chairs, et cetera, based on the child's age and other needs. And then they had home improvement opportunities as well. There's some more popping on screen, affordable housing. What's currently available as affordable is not really affordable to many. Could the city have pilot projects where they test materials in the road and sidewalk construction that require less maintenance? And this would equate with lower costs in the long run. And kudos, 100% agree on the trees. And the lake, and the lake of care and the lack of care and maintenance the city has beautiful case and budget that needs to change and to clean up the budget for five years until they get a handle on all the other or the overgrown trees. Ward Parkway is a mess. I also saw something in the comments about um, the auditor and not listening to what citizens are interested in, in terms of what's budgeted. And then there's a question, are there existing methodologies for public-private partnerships where the local residents can and do want help to underwrite improvements? Uh, 
and I think we're now got ourselves kind of okay on time. I think we have two more topics to go in this. Is there anyone else that would like to share something that they're thinking about in relationship to infrastructure and city services? We have an active chat um, going on as well. Sidewalks are a mess. Street resurfing, excuse me, resurfacing is way behind. That's from Greg in the chat. And I think that's all I see right now in the chat. And again, we're going to give you a link. When I give you the link at the end of the meeting, I would really encourage you to, if you can, to use a device that's not your phone so that you can see all the content in a larger way as we go through this. Um, and then there's a comment from Tracy in the chat about dwellings for houseless people. I assume you're talking about housing provision. Tracy, and then Marcus is saying, it seems like planning is uncoordinated on street construction and closure. We can't close adjacent arteries. So more funding, more neighborhood control, something that we're hearing. And then Steve has his hand up in the chat. Yeah. We're not in the chat, put your hands up. I, I, I didn't mean to come back so quickly, but uh, I guess okay. based with the tree comment and some of these other comments, I mean, it, it, what it seems like to me, uh, you know, it was today I was walking on Main Street at thir between 39th and 40th. And, you know, it's just like, there doesn't seem like there's a whole project there. It seems like there's the, the streetcar is going to come in. There's a lot of street demolition. Hopefully the street's going to be brought back. Hopefully the sidewalks are going to be beautiful and walkable and safe. But there's this, there's a lot of uncoordination, it seems like, between what Parks, is, I guess Parks is in charge of the trees. I'm really not sure. But whoever's in charge of the trees, who's ever in charge of major projects, uh, and that if there were a way for the city to be really aligned uh, amongst all the departments and that planning uh, and the Public Arts Commission, who's really responsible for the public realm, if all that could really drive a uh, coordinated effort between departments to ensure that, the, that we create the kind of public and space that we share is that safe, that's beautiful, that's sustainable, that really delivers the quality of experiences that we all deserve, I think. And right now, I think that's not, we're not there. We're kind of uncoordinated. And so we see these, what, uh, what appear to be examples of waste or inefficiency. And so somehow or another, if we can, and I'm not sure if a plan can do that, but um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that Mr. Williams can figure that out. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Does anyone else have a thought you'd like to share? There's comments about um, the recycling centers. We need more of those. That's from Christy in the chat. She loves um, the Missouri organic, but we can capitalize on natural resources as a city pay for mulch when we have our own. There's comments on the screen more about the trees and particular types of trees. Also comments about making the bus system easier to use. Anything else? I see in the chat from Gail, more interdepartmental coordination on infrastructure. For example, she's seen street repaved, a street repaved over a water leak, and then the street was later dug up to repair the water pipe. Marcus is asking, what about using the same idea he suggested for community gardens, but now in the model of housing repair, allowing neighbors to be paid when jobbed to other neighborhoods? 
something else in the chat is requiring developers to fix the roads they ruin. Visa, let me add, and it's, it's a bit of a, of a commercial for um, next week's strategy session on serviceability, but lots of the comments and feedback we're receiving today is about coordination of activities, coordination between departments, other types of things, those comments um, really is feedback. And again, while we're focusing in today on livability, but those things that you've talked about, people make comments in that way, really look at the serviceability. How do we provide service and how do we look as a city to maintain things? So this feedback is very helpful. Um, and we'll be having a conversation focused in again on, on how do we provide services in an efficient, effective, sustainable manner. So that's next week's conversation. If people have the opportunity to participate, we'd love to see you there. But again, know the, the feedback flows from strategy area to, to strategy area. Mm -hmm. There's more comments in the chat um, about community mind, having more social and community minded officers and then um, from Crunch in the chat, it says city needs to build a new jail and include a mental health facility. People are being put back on the streets that need help, not and that need help, not made comfortable on the streets or not made available. Maybe that's what it should be on the streets. All right. Let's go to our fifth topic which is housing affordability, quality, and diversity. And there were already some comments earlier about housing. So incentivizing, uh, so what we've heard, incentivizing more housing rehab than new construction. Uh, I've seen quite a few comments in the chat about, uh, you know, related to development, developers. Um, so policy that encourages investment and incentives for rehabbing existing structures. Um, you know, what do we do about abandoned properties and then uh, preservation of affordable units uh, in areas that, that may be in transition and seeing uh, new development and some of that uh, affordable housing uh, goes away. Adaptive reuse of existing and underdeveloped properties. So recognize and capitalize on what we already have. Adaptive reuse. Um, obviously, it's just taking an existing structure and adapting it to a different use than uh, it was originally constructed for housing, for example, uh, you know, lofts or something like that. Um, underdeveloped property, uh, you know, this is where accessory dwelling units might come in or there's, uh, you know, potentially too much parking on a site and there's room to develop more units, something like that. Uh, promoting development of small lot and unique housing types. Uh, accessory dwelling units allow our aging population to live in neighborhoods near family. Next slide, please. So based on those comments, uh, some of the draft recommendations are exploring strategies to encourage adaptive reuse of existing developed and underdeveloped properties. So uh, how do we um, implement uh, increase, incentivize adaptive reuse strategies. Um, so brownfield redevelopment, um, finding those underutilized properties, um, infill development on underdeveloped properties, uh, incentivizing more rehabilitation of existing housing stock rather than new construction. So a focus on uh, revitalizing what exists already. Uh, explore and implement tools such as inclusionary zoning, work for ho workforce housing tax credits, and other uh, incentives to rehab existing housing into affordable housing. Uh, promoting development of small lot housing and unique housing types. Uh, so encouraging mixed income neighborhoods uh, through review of land use regulations to allow multifamily units in areas of the city that are already uh, developed. Um, and also looking at how do we incorporate uh, some of these other housing types into greenfield developments, into new developments. Um, considering other strategies like uh, limited equity cooperatives, community land trusts, tenant right to purchase legislation, there are uh, a set of tools out there um, that uh, are being uh, looked at 
and uh, explored for implementation. Next slide, please. And that's it in terms of just what we've been talking about. So I'd love to know what your reactions to some of those things are. We're talking about housing affordability, quality, and diversity. Is there something missing that's coming to mind? You have some thoughts that you want to share. So you do need to unmute or raise your hand and unmute. I know in the chat, Bill, while you were talking, there's a comment. There were some comments going in that'll show up on screen in a bit. I saw the one related to uh, speed of permitting. That's something that we've, we've talked about in particular for these uh, smaller developers related to incremental development. Uh, yeah, that, that is uh, extremely important. Um, you know, the carrying cost of, of owning land that you want to develop is, is uh, you know, certainly something that uh, we are uh, cognizant of and, and understand uh, it puts up a barrier to entry there. Mm -hmm. Marcus has in the chat, ensure equity and prioritize resources to the neighborhoods that need help. Beth is saying, look into the percentage of homes being bought by investors versus homeowners and seeing if legislation or ordinances need to be made to increase the ability of homeowners to find homes to buy instead of renting from investors that are buying up the properties. Lisa saying update and follow the city economic development incentive policies to ensure that developers, city staff, and the community understand the importance of tax incentives and the success of some historic restoration projects. Um, Crunch agrees with Mike. Um, only one happy with the Redbridge project is the contractor at this point. It's almost as bad as the 89th, 85th Memorial project that was redone two times. We need to support owner occupied housing and also small landlords. That's from Marcus in the chat. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Can the city create policy that requires and encourages mixed income neighborhoods? Speed, the speed of permitting is essential. set a legal definition for affordable instead of using the state and federal data. Three ways um, updating buildings improves equity between communities and that number one, renovating a single building can spur investment in the community, but it needs to be done with purpose and avoid gentrification. Number two, be intentional about local participation. And the comment here about out of town developers, they should be held at a higher, um, be held to higher building standards. Otherwise they develop flip and run. The tax assessment issue is critical, but that's also a county and state issue. I'm scrolling back up in case there's something I might have missed. And again, if anyone has a comment you want to share out loud, please raise your hand so you can unmute and we can hear your voice. Okay, Scott has his hand up. I, I figured I'd play along. Uh, since you asked, so <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so the other issue uh, that that we especially find is in order to get more ownership, you have to have people who are in a position to buy, and so that gets into issues of of banking, gets into issues of buyers being in a position to get mortgages, and so as uh, as I saw. In, the, in one of the boxes related to developing that home ownership base, there's got to be uh, some thinking about that. Um, in the past, the city has put at least some of its CDBG dollars to organizations that do help home buyers, but, but it's more than just the information. You actually have to have um, people who, go, who may go through financial education or at the very least lenders 
who are prepared to lend for those who, you know, may want to live in areas where historically uh, lenders have tried to stay away from. Uh, but, but that whole issue is important to, to, to make that connection for ownership. Thank you, Scott. Definitely need to be in the position to be able to buy. Tim, um, we'll, do you want to go ahead and unmute, share your thoughts? And then after you, we'll go to our last topic. Um, yeah, I think on the housing issue, you know, one component mm -hmm. is, you know, with out-of-state landlords that are not really being beneficial to the community is a, an effective enforcement, uh, which I think is built into the Tenant Bill of Rights and the, and the structures there to do that. But I think that would solve, you know, uh, a part of the piece of the problem with, with housing if that were to be uh, enforceable. Um, you know, based on what already exists uh, on paper uh, within City Hall. Thank you, Tim. I think with that, we have about 17 minutes left. So I'm gonna go to our last topic. And this is eliminating disparities. Thanks, Travis. Uh, so, this is, of course, a, a big topic. Um, there is a uh, you know a, a lot of conversation going on, not only in Kansas City but nationally, uh, surrounding this topic um, as it relates to affordable housing and uh, displacement and all these sorts of things. And um, you know there are other aspects of eliminating disparities as well, but. Uh, it, it uh, certainly is a, a big national conversation right now. Um, so what we heard specifically uh, from participants in sessions one and two, ensuring all neighborhoods have access to an education on basic city resources and processes. Um, so access to civic education is paramount. Um, work with neighborhood schools to provide educational resources, uh, social workers, counselors, uh, you know, other community services, uh, more equitable public health outcomes. Um, health is vital. Uh, there were, of course, many more comments there um, talking about, um, you know, differences in health outcomes, whether it's age or race or, you know, uh, there's a number of variables there, but uh, certainly, um, you know, the data is, is pretty stark in some cases. Um, rethinking the city's infrastructure investments, alloc allocations to more equitably distribute resources based on need. Um, the comment we heard, education on city resources, diverse leadership, rethinking the city's budget allocations. Next slide, please. So some draft recommendations, ensuring all neighborhoods have access to and education on basic city resources and processes. Explore new development options that provide housing, training, and employment opportunities on the same site. Uh, more equitable public health outcomes and access to housing, jobs, education, and services. Um, creating and implementing need-based priority framework or frameworks for multimodal infrastructure investments. Um, and, and that's more than just about being able to, uh, to travel by whichever mode you choose. That also then uh, empowers access to jobs, um, recreation, and all these other uh, amenities within the city. Next slide, please. Rethinking the city's infrastructure investment allocations to more equitably distribute resources based on need. We heard a lot about this. Uh, developing categories of need. Uh, some examples may include uh, infrastructure improvements, sustainable development, uh, natural resource protection. As Director Williams mentioned earlier, there is a lot of overlap between these. Um, in serviceability, we also talk about uh, critical natural resources, and and uh, you know there there is quite a bit of overlap. Um, and uh, somebody mentioned earlier when they were talking, uh, you know the the connection between all of these. 
these aspects. Uh, work with the community, particularly those in underserved areas to populate the categories of need. So once we have this structure, uh, you know, what, what are those uh, specific needs and categories of needs, as we've mentioned several times, you know, that the neighborhood residents know what's going on in their neighborhood and are well equipped to, uh, to communicate what those needs are. Uh, invest in infrastructure improvements where the greatest needs are identified. And next slide. So again, with the last few minutes that we have of the meeting time, we're asking for your thoughts on the eliminating disparities topic, the recommendations, the draft ones that we've shared with you and that Bill just went over. Let us know if we're missing, if we need something. Um, if we need to clarify anything, if you have questions, also again, just raise your hand and you can unmute and you can share your thoughts aloud. All right, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I was glad to hear the phrase at least a few times um, to really focus on folks in the city, neighborhoods in the city that have the greatest need. And, you know, really a vision of a city where everybody's well educated, uh, everybody's got um, uh, makes a livable wage. Everybody's got secure housing. Everybody has food access, including fresh produce would really be a wonderful thing. Hopefully we can see it in our lifetime. So I'm really encouraged that you all, that, that we all are hearing this idea of let's focus on folks that have the greatest need in the city. And then that way we're more secure, happier and uh, healthier. So thanks very much. Thanks, Tim. In terms of eliminating disparities, there's some comments on screen. I think they're directly from the chat. Some of them might have been made inside of Mentimeter. Talking about access to education for people of voting age as well as minors, a number of community centers in the center and south side of KC. They don't, um, not much to offer in the Northland. We need a caseworker for children and families, opportunities to invest in our future, our youth. Issues of race, income, health, and education um, was in the human investment component of the focus plan. Will those relevant recommendations transfer to this? That's a question. And I know that staff is going through all of focus and pulling over lots and lots of recommendations. Focus is a great plan. There's um, a lot of great content to pull over and bring into the new plan. Um, what else? Public health needs to include all aspects of health, not just classic physician health, but also vision, mental, and oral. Great thinking, community outreach being done by the city team on this plan, publicized succinctly, multiple times, share with the civic voices. Thank you for your collective efforts. There is an enormous largest coming down from the bipartisan infrastructure law, but most entities with true need, don't have the capacity to get the benefits. Also, as a woman and a mother, I do not see people like myself having authority in our city. Livability, equity would be the ability for citizens to access and utilize services available. Um, so community centers and NPOs and GEOs, so nonprofits who might be great recipients don't have resources to access the BIL. Definitely need city reps in historically excluded neighborhoods to sit down and help people use digital tools they are expected to use, but have never been taught how to use. There are many ways to access information, but there is no communication vehicle to push residents to where they can find that information. A key element that crosses all plans is how do we rebuild, gain the public's trust? This needs to be an active effort. And the plan needs to think through how do these recommendations, think through these recommendations. If we all, um, if all we, if all we say is use public engagement, we need to creatively improve 
what we already do. This is a tool to achieve the basis or the goals. And then learn to celebrate community engagement regardless of status or voting. Let's see if there's anything else on screen. There's another level to go down which shows operationally how these things are executed. Are there any other comments? Does anyone else want to share aloud? Again, if so, you just need to raise your hand. If you've given one of the comments that's on screen or in the chat and you want to elaborate on it, sound with your voice, again, raise your hand so you can unmute and we can hear you. In the chat, Mike's saying, think many small projects um, for multiple successes. And that can be publicized. Street sweepers, mowing along roads, fixing fences, trimming trees have big impact on confidence and pride. Go ahead, Scott. Thanks. Um, I was just thinking through this uh... The box that that talks about rebuilding and gaining the public's trust. Um, it strikes me as we're looking at all of these, uh, and and I, I take Vicky's comments uh, to heart as well. But you know, one of the issues that you have many times is when everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. And, and it strikes me as I look at all these uh, ideas, and all of them. Uh, have have great relevance and pertinence to the conversation, but you know if, if you can't prioritize what is probably the most important things, whatever those things are, then it's hard for people to to feel like hey this plan is working and this plan is being followed. So I, I guess it may be uh, to, to to bring an action to it or a question to it. Um, I do wonder again how far into the weeds the plan will get as far as suggesting, um, you know, top projects within each of these categories that the city should pursue. Um, because I feel like if, if that isn't done, then it's very easy for that confidence uh, to go away very quickly. So that prioritization I think is an important part and I thank you for allowing me to, to mention that. No problem, thanks Scott. So I know we have six minutes to go and I know that Jeff would like to close. So how about if we wrap this part of it up and we go with next steps? Yes, Dravisa, thank you. And I wanted to make sure that we had a few minutes to talk about uh, what uh, we do as we conclude these round of, of strategy sessions. and. The idea is then beginning to, to put together the, the document and, and the text that will be a part of the comprehensive plan. Um, I, this is a good time for me to mention that again, you know, we've appreciated getting your feedback and understanding on a whole host of, of recommendations. And as the group has said, we are seeing just a smattering or a sampling of, of how the recommendations and not only those things that you've contributed, but those things that carried through from um, from focus um, and work still that is relevant and remains to be done. Ultimately, it's our work on how that all gets expressed into, into action items, which is what I'm hearing as well. It's great to identify all these things, but how does it actually happen? And I think through the comments just, just stated recently through a call, it's, it's not only an action, but how do you prioritize action? And then ultimately, how do you also uh, measure progress? What, what metrics, what um, criteria you're going to use to understand when something is done, is it completed? Um, has it been successful? So I want to take a few minutes to talk about what um, those next steps for us begin to, to look like. So if you could advance to the next slide. I think this is it. After that, it's just, it's a thank you. Okay, then that is, <laughs> then that is it. Then let me wrap up beyond. Thank you, but also let me do a few things as I'm saying thank you as well. 
um, a, a couple of things to remind people of. Uh, thank you for participation today, but a number of you on the call have been to multiple uh, strategy sessions. And so we have the third strategy session regarding the topic of serviceability. And again, as we talk about lots of the comment today, comments today have lots of relevance over in the serviceability section. And that uh, third serviceability strategy session will be held on Thursday, May 26th, starting at 3.30 p.m. Um, the people who attend today to go over there, uh, you'll, be, you'll be pros because you'll know exactly what the format of the meeting will be. And you'll have already thought about lots of issues that will have relevance over in the serviceability conversation. So um, we thank you. And thank you for um, us um, maybe hurrying along a few conversations in some places and, and slowing down a bit um, because we want to make sure that we give spend most of our time giving the opportunity to provide feedback. We also know we need to provide some time for people who are new to the conversation because we want to get them up to speed and get them comfortable so that everybody's attending um, will be able to provide participation. So, you know, as mentioned earlier on, we're going to take all of this feedback, all this work, and now we need to get to the task of putting together um, recommendations and action action items and things that we will vet and share with all of you as we work our way through through the process. Um, this is an opportunity for me to, to thank uh, the staff members of city planning and development um, for all of their work involved here and thanks to Travis and Bill um, and Maddie for the work that they're doing in terms of presenting the, this information and structuring these strategy sessions today. So thank you very much. As always, um, we learn a lot from these um, sessions. Uh, know that through the KC Spirit Playbook site, we'll provide you links. You'll see in the chat actually a link to be able to continue providing Mentimeter comments on these topics over the next seven days. So capture that link um, before the call ends. We'll also post this meeting online for people to be able to see it. Um, please keep continuing to check back in on the um, KC Spirit Playbook website, playbook.kcmo.gov. Please make sure you do that and check in with us. Um, and again, we thank you and we look, we look forward to seeing you next week and we certainly appreciate your time today. Thank you very, very much. With your help and your work, we will have an amazing document to help us assure that Kansas City grows sustainably and equitably and inclusively um, over the next 20 years. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day, everybody.